so watch me whip and watch me nay nay. This is a murder tizer and it's going to be kind of a mix of case updates and <laughs> weird ass stories from my weird ass life. So Peter Chadwick, we covered in episode 85, episode 95, a murder tizer. And then we had the interview with Detective Joe in episode 123, and he was on the Federal Marshals Task Force. So if you don't remember, Peter Chadwick was an Orange County millionaire who led investigators on a years-long manhunt after he was charged with his wife's slaying. He pled guilty a few weeks ago now, just because of technical difficulties, but a week and a half, two weeks ago, he pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life in state prison. And I will tell you that Detective Joe called me the day that he pled guilty because I don't think either of us thought that would happen, considering the lengths he went to evade arrest and prosecution. And he was upset that it was only 15 years, but it's 15 years to life. And I'm just going to hold on to the fact that it would be more toward the life part, not the 15 years. So what happened was he strangled and drowned his wife, who was then 46 years old, Ki Chu Chadwick. And it's Q-U-E-E-C-H-O-O. -E -E so they called her QC for short. So Ki Chu Chadwick was in the bathroom of their Newport Beach home on October 10th, 2012. And he strangled her and drowned her and then wrapped her in a comforter and drove around until he found a dumpster in San Diego County, south of where they lived in Orange County. So that's awesome. And then he staged an elaborate bullshittery kind of thing where he wasn't there to pick up his sons who were school age. He had an older son who was at a boarding school in Ojai and his two younger sons were in, in school in Orange County. So a neighbor saw them and picked them up and brought them home. And when no one was home, she called for a welfare check. They found some blood upstairs in the master bathroom bathtub and some broken beach themed figurines around the tub. Probably something you would use to calm yourself during a soothing bath because you're married to a narcissist who was trying to find a replacement wife for you after you'd been married almost 20 years and had three kids with him. So Peter Chadwick, awesome dude, millionaire, kind of a real estate, I don't want to call him a slumlord. You know, he owned properties and, and she helped him, but she was mostly a stay-at-home mom and she was pretty spectacular. She would leave these very supportive post-it notes around the kitchen for her sons. Like, you know, today is going to be a great day. Be kind, do good works. I mean, she was just, yeah. So Peter dumps her in a dumpster and of all the dumpsters in all the world, he makes the mistake of putting her in a dumpster at the end of a very large property with a long driveway. And they are having a dispute with waste management and they hadn't paid their bill. And so they did not get their dumpster emptied on Thursday. And five days later, on Friday, wouldn't you know it, investigators who are combing everything in South Orange County and North San Diego County find a woman wrapped in a comforter in a dumpster. And it's QC. A day and a half after he went missing, he called 911 from a McDonald's <laughs> in South San Diego County, almost at the border of Mexico, and said, you know, help, they've got her. They killed her. Help. And I do have to say, I could not have asked for better 911 operators than these two women who take at first take his statement seriously and are saying, well, sir, what's, what's happening? What do you, you know? And he says, I was kidnapped by Chi and Juan and they drove us around with my wife's dead body. And then they stopped at the border and they had a green pickup truck waiting and they left and they took her, they took her body. Okay. Let's go over that again, sir. Uh, 
And it was hilarious because the woman was like, you can hold on. I'm going to get my supervisor. So I remember the one woman's name is Crystal. I don't remember her supervisor's name, but it was uh, spectacular as he was tag teamed, doubted by two women who were like, you are talking shit buddy. They're like, now why would they take her body? So he said that they had maybe raped and killed her in the bathroom upstairs while he was downstairs working in the office because they were rifling through things in the master bedroom and she caught them. So they killed her and then they kidnapped him. Now why they didn't kill him as a witness, I don't know. Yeah, you can say it just wasn't bought from minute one. And what happens when you're a millionaire? and the judge assigns you a bail of $2 million, you get an attorney that is very high priced who says, my client is not a flight risk, that is an excessive bail, and it's lower to a million, and you're like, oh, hey, let me pull out my wallet, that's pocket change, here's 100 grand, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya, and then he splits, and he is harbored by family, his father, who is a large compound in Santa Barbara. And this is all in the episodes you can hear in the past episodes, episode 85 and 123. And he goes on the run for four years. He is in Mexico, living in high-end resorts. And when they found him in Puebla, Mexico, which is apparently a very large community for expats from the U.S., he was a busboy at, <laughs> at a fancy resort. I don't know how that works. I don't know if you check in and pay your own bill and then, and then you go, I need, I need a little pocket change. And so they give you a job. <laughs> so it's a busboy. So Peter Chadwick has an interesting life. I am shocked that when the federal marshals task force was able to find him and bring him back to the U.S., extradite him, that he now decided to change his plea to guilty. So, and and this isn't, you know, I got to give him one, I got to give him one check mark in the good box. With his plea agreement, he decided to not receive any credit toward his 15 year to life prison sentence for the time he served in county jail while awaiting trial. And before the plea deal, he had faced 25 years to life. So maybe he thought, I'll I'll admit it, I'll get out earlier. I think he's just a complete and utter narcissist. He said, I wish I could take it back. He said this to the judge. I compounded that by running away from it. I destroyed everything, so I deserve whatever the court decides. Yeah, you do. I wish the court had decided more. He said, I just want to express that I'm truly sorry Somehow, I hope my wife's family can carry on remembering what kind of person she was. Such a great person, so loving, and she cared for everyone. I wish I could deliver that line in the way he delivered his 911 call. I hope that my wife's family can somehow carry on remembering what kind of person she was. Beep, boop, boop. When the Federal Marshal's Task Force went to his father's home in Santa Barbara, they found some interesting stuff like books he forgot, <laughs> how to change your identity, surviving in Mexico. It was super weird that there's video of him entering the Santa Barbara airport, which I'm guessing is probably pretty small, dressed as a man and then never coming back out. <laughs> he had a duffel bag. I think he came out dressed as a woman. There's video of him. There's, you know, uh, going into the airport, there's video of him sitting in a chair right by the restrooms. And then he never comes back out as a man again. And he is not a guy. You'd be like, oh, that's that's a middle-aged woman. And no, no. You'd be like, that man is melting and thinks he's a woman. So yeah, not not good. The pictures online, I have to say, were pretty indicative of what happened. And I mean, I guess, you know, he had he's, he was bruised with like green and yellow bruises and scratches on his arms and, you know, like two day old bruises. And I still remember when he was arrested the first time, I still remember Detective Joe calling me in August of 2019 and said, you know, he was extradited from Mexico today. And I was like, wow, wow. I mean, yeah. So Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer said three young boys lost their entire reality that day that their mother was murdered by their father. 
It took years of painstaking police work to track down this defendant in order to hold him accountable for the murder of his wife and the mother of his three sons. What's interesting is that Peter Chadwick had an attorney, a private attorney, high-priced attorney, Robert Sanger, who could not be immediately reached for comment. Robert Sanger has some interesting clients. One was Michael Jackson, who he successfully defended in 2005 and secured a not guilty verdict in the child molestation case that was in Santa Barbara. And his other client is Paul Flores. Presently, Paul Flores, Paul and his father are charged with the murder and hiding of the body of Kristen Smart in San Luis Obispo. So he's an interesting uh, fellow. He seems to pick really bad clients. I guess they just have a lot of money. Maybe that's, you know, good motivator. And the next case update is one I don't even want to talk about, but we're going to. Sherry Papini. In 2016, the Northern California wife and mother of two disappeared while on a jog, and it just it just bothers the shit right out of me. This and Peter Chadwick's case, I have to say the connection. Peter Chadwick said two Hispanic day laborers beat and killed his wife and kidnapped him. Sherry Papini said two Hispanic women kidnapped her from her jog in Redding, California. You know, if you're going to be a jack wagon and Munchausen some attention your way by faking a kidnapping, murdering your spouse, and trying to put it on someone else. You know what? Pick somebody in your own race. Don't don't do that shit. Don't pick somebody that you think is an easy scapegoat. That's to me, you should be charged an extra level, like special circumstances for making it more of a hate crime by saying it's, you know, someone of a different race. That's That's some bullshit. So blondie, you know, beautiful Sherry Papini says that, you know, she's uh, kidnapped by two Hispanic. Well, we don't know that she's missing for like three weeks. It's just, you know, and the thing that kills me is that there was a private investigator who, you know, said he was really taken in, Bill Garcia. And it breaks my heart if Bill Garcia was taken in. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm not a fan of private investigators anymore. I thought, oh, you know what? They have a different level than citizen sleuths. They can get more information, but they're not sworn officers like police officers. And a lot of private investigators are retired police officers. I got a call from not a retired police officer, but a private investigator who thinks he's phenomenal on Tuesday night screaming at me about an episode and told me I had to take it down. And I said, well, if the, you know, missing person's family member wants me to do that, I will, but I'm not listening to you. The entire time screaming at me that he had been on many TV shows. And I was like, I don't need your resume, sir. So I feel bad for Bill Garcia as the private investigator that was hired to find Sherry Papini. But it bothers me that he says, I was a little bit awry. Things went a little bit awry from the beginning because her headphones were found in the bushes with some of her hair on it, which would indicate a scuffle, but the cords were wrapped around the headphones neatly. And if someone's taken against their will, you're not going to find an item like the headphone cord tightly wound and sitting on top of a tuft of grass. Bill Garcia said, usually they may be broken, they may be absent to show some sort of struggle. So for them to have been found the way they were, where they were found, it was interesting to me. And I never really forgot about that and kind of carried that in the back of my mind as I helped conduct the search. So he volunteered, you know, at the beginning before he was hired to search for her. That's the kind of PI you like. I feel bad for him because he says, you know, I'm sure she did it for a reason, which we may never know. Did she feel she wasn't getting enough attention from her family or her husband? Was she seeking attention? Did someone upset her? I think the part that makes me most upset is she implicated two Hispanic women, which, you know, he said he received several calls about Hispanic women, you know, friends from tipsters who were suspected kidnappers. And he said, that's the most painful part. You know, he said she was a mother of two small children. I felt I needed to volunteer, but now I can't shake the feeling that I've been duped. 
and this is the first time I've been hoaxed in 30 years. So I'm trying to be kind to Sherry Papini because I, she obviously has mental issues. I also don't care anymore. I just think it's remarkably shitty, and I hope she gets help if she needs it. But, you know, she apparently got money from a, a fund, a victim's fund. You know, I, I don't know what's going on, you know, and this was 2016. I mean, she's now 39 years old. So what was she? She'd been 34. Like what, you know, what can be so bad? If you want to get away from your husband, fucking do it. Just divorce him. Apparently she spent time with an ex-boyfriend in Costa Mesa in Orange County in Southern California. Just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Sherry Papini was arrested on fraud charges. So hopefully whatever version of justice can happen in a fake kidnapping that she will get the justice that we deserve from her bizarre actions. So admin of justice classes are going well. It's criminal investigation this semester, bank heists, robbery versus burglary, sexual assault, homicide. It's it's an awful lot. And our final exam is going to be split into groups and we have to solve a drive-by shooting. And the professor is not <laughs> is not enacting a drive-by shooting, so we have something to investigate. It's all fake. But it sounds amazing. He recruited previous students to act out the parts, and they videotaped it. And again, we've split into small groups. And I am so lucky because I'm in a group with Bobby V, who is a couple of decades veteran of the, I guess maybe the LAPD. I'm not quite sure what agency he's with, but I know he's worked on a gang unit and pretty excited. So we're getting together uh, tomorrow to discuss how we tackle the the final exam. I'll let you know. I'm very excited and honored to meet him. So it's going to be cool. So I want to punch, not really. I'm also, I'm in Facebook jail for 30 days for threatening to kick the ass of a woman I don't really know because he, uh, not, not her, her husband's ass, her ex-husband's ass, because his friends are bothering her on social media, even though he's been gone for 12 years, he left her, put her items in a storage unit, didn't pay the bill. Her items got sold. He moved to the East coast after having an affair with her friend and wiped out her IRA. So I said, wow, I can't imagine. And if I knew where to find him, I would kick his ass. Metaphorically, a guy I've never met and a woman I've never really met, but know through friends on Facebook because he did terrible things to her. And I'm in Facebook jail for 30 days. So so that's fun. So I'm not going to punch tipster Dorota. She also lives in Poland. So that I, I'm not going to fly there to kill her or punch her. Not nothing. Not going to do anything. These are empty threats. Only because she sent me the Lake Waco murders. And I thought it was interesting. I, I've been working on this for so long and it's just taking so long. And we recorded an episode and then it, you know, didn't go well. So I'm just fucking done. I'm done. I'm over this shit. I want it done. But it is a really fascinating case and it's layered like baklava and it will be a two-parter. And I'm trying to get excited about talking about it. Some of the issues with the case, even though it's been adjudicated and and everyone involved is deceased, is junk science, i.e. forensic odontology. Do I think all forensic odontology is junk science? No. Do I think a lot of it? Possibly. I did not know this. It's taken me into my dotage to know that teeth are moving all the time. So I feel like it's difficult to call it a science. I think it's more of a guesstimation hobby. So my own teeth, I had great teeth my whole life, never had braces, nothing. I wait until I'm almost a thousand years old to have to wear a motherfucking retainer for six months. I take it out when I record because if I didn't, I would sound like Stanley Sister Shelley from South Park. It's absolutely positively awful. But it's given me a once a month appointment to bond even further with my beloved dentist, Dr. Suarez. He is an amazing creature and he has agreed to be a guest on the podcast. And we're going to talk about his passion for dentistry, but also forensic odontology, it's pluses and minuses. So 
you know, he's been, he was Mark and Mai's dentist for 20 years now. He opened his practice in our area and a friend of his was making copies of flyers. And I was like, hey, you know a dentist? And I was like, oh, we're going. And we have never looked back. He has been so terrific to us. I just, you know, and that, so that'll be coming up. I can't tell you when it might be a month or two because there's other things on the burners, but he wants to do it. And I am excited, excited to talk to him. I promise it will happen. And I want to say a special thank you to tipster Kevin, who sent me a lovely email about the podcast. He didn't know about producer Mark and he had listened to the Barbara Colby case and suggested another unsolved case involving an actress, Krista Helm. So we're going to be covering that coming up. And I wanted to mention that Marissa from The Vanished has a very fascinating episode regarding several missing and murdered women in the Pacific Northwest. And some of them may not get the justice they deserve, but some of the family members of these women, these are the advocates you want in the world. They keep pushing for DNA to be tested on other people's cases. They realize their own family member's case may not be solved, but spectacular, spectacular people. And they have actually tied a serial killer, Warren Forrest, who I had never heard of, who's still alive, denying all of it. Fascinating creature. He's tied to another case. And and I'm hoping that he will be tied to more. I think that's a, a strong possibility. And I'm not really sure how Marissa does it, especially in one episode. This is, it, it's spectacular what she was able to achieve in one episode. And for my money, she does the best missing persons podcast I've ever heard. You know, everyone has a different style. We don't, you know, have a, a similar style at all. We don't talk alike or, or approach things similarly, but we both want the best for all of these cases. And for my money, she does the best missing persons podcast. I never wanted to cover missing persons. I really didn't. I never wanted to cover unsolved homicides. I like things wrapped up with a bow on them. I really like solved cases. And that is what I endeavored to do for the first year of this podcast. It was you, my beloved tipsters, who said, hey, would you consider covering, you know, an unsolved homicide? Because I'm, you know, tangentially uh, acquainted with the case, or I know someone, or it's a family member, or would you consider covering a missing persons case? And I was like, you know, begrudgingly, I was like, okay. And I did it one, I was going to do one a month and that lasted a few months. (laughs) And then it was every week. And I will be honest with you, I occasionally need to do a solved case because I can't take it. I need a palate cleanser. I know, I know. And you tipsters are the same, but I sit up at night, you know, thinking, how can this be solved? How can someone help? Someone knows something. I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone, but I just, you know, I, I need a break right now. So I was really excited when tipster Dorota sent me the Lake Waco murders until I got into it. And then now, as I said, I, I want to punch her a little bit, but I don't cause she's a lovely human being. She's also a patron on Patreon. So probably shouldn't punch her. That would be detrimental to myself. So it's going to be a, at least a two part series because it's just too much information. There's too much that's gone on in a 40 year old case, you know, it's July of 1982. So look for that. It will be coming up. If it hasn't already, the first part hasn't already aired. I'm not exactly sure in what order these things are going to go, but please know I am so grateful to you tipsters for hanging in there with me. You are spectacular and I'm not sure what I've done to deserve you, but I am really grateful. And if you have a tip on a missing person or an unsolved homicide, or you just want to suggest a case, please feel free to give us a call at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. You can email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. You can find us on any of the social media platforms, the Just the Tipsters Facebook page, JT Tipsters on Instagram, JT Tipsters Pod on Twitter. 
and more cowbell. <laughs>